So, okay, guys. So, welcome everyone. That's another another meeting that has been organized within the framework of the weekly fasting group, which is a big international community where we fast every week for at least twenty four hours. Uh, it's a really open minded community. We have people. It's it's operating on WhatsApp. Uh, we have people from virtually all over the world any country and from coming from different dietary backgrounds, religious backgrounds. So there are no requirements to join this group. We welcome everyone. We love everyone. And um, um, the only common denominator being that we fast every week for 24 hours at a certain time as a group. And again, if you join this group, it can be dry fast, water fast, juice fast, food fast, whatever, whatever suits you the best. It's really open minded. And we also organize those webinars with different experts uh, in the fields of healing, health in general, um, interesting lifestyles, etc. And we're just in order to learn, you know, without any agenda, we're not trying to convert anyone into anything, just to learn from each other and to make our own choices. So, um, and, uh, so if you are interested in those ideas appeal to you, um, uh, you, you will find my WhatsApp number below this video. My name is Arik. I, I operate this group uh, and uh, you're welcome to send me your name and uh, your, your willingness to join the group and I will happily add you. That's for those who are watching later on. Now, today we have with us again, Paul Nissan. So, hello, Paul. Hello, hello. Hello, thank you for having me back. Thank you so much. We're going to have the second, uh, the second session because uh, the last time Paul was limited in terms of his time. So we talked about, Paul has uh, close to 30 years of experience in raw foods and different healing modalities. So Paul, my first question I wanted to ask you, like if, if, if you meet today a newbie, you know, someone who is interested in the fields of raw foods and nutrition in general, what kind, what kind of advice would you give them how to proceed and what well, to take into account? Sure. First, you said if they're interested, and I would find out why they're interested. Is this somebody who has a disease and they're looking to get better? Or is this somebody that just heard about this on the internet and they want to try it? So I want to know what their goal is and why they're doing it. If somebody says they just want to lose weight, I don't necessarily recommend them just switch on a raw food diet because then when they go back to eating whatever they were eating before, they're going to put their weight back. So mm -hmm. it depends what their goal is, what they're trying to accomplish. If somebody has certain diseases, uh, I would, you know, you have to switch things up to work with the particular illness that they're dealing with. Uh, so, so yeah, it's what somebody's goal is. But if somebody just wants to be healthier and they want to eat healthier, uh, it's not necessary for everyone to eat 100% raw. For myself, it was easier to do all raw uh, because I completely got rid of the, the, the taste and the feeling of cooked food. And it's also easier to stay all raw than if I ate a little cooked food, then it'd be more of a challenging. And also, if I do eat cooked food or, or you know, any animal foods, it, it wouldn't be healthy because I had ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and that would bother the condition. So for me, I have a motivation to stay 100% raw. So I would suggest people to start off by eating maybe eight, 75 to 80% raw foods, and the other 25% could be cooked food, but eat the raw food first. And the cooked food shouldn't be very processed. Uh, I prefer people to go on a vegan diet uh, if they if they want to be as healthy as possible. From my research, I've found that's the healthiest uh, way to eat. And, you know, I would tell people the health is more than just diet alone. There's many other aspects to health. So, uh, you know, I would explore the other different ideas of, of their lifestyle. For example, you know, if somebody said that they were... Uh, you know, of a particular faith, I would question, well, are you following it? Because if you're not, then that could raise up some some situations. So, uh, but for the most part, you know, I'd let people know about the other aspects of health as well. But raw foods is not difficult to do. Uh, but if you're going to do it, you got to do it the right way. And that's pretty much making sure you're eating healthy because just because it says raw food doesn't mean it's healthy. There's a lot of raw food candy bars out there and everything else. So you want to do it the right way. And that would be uh, the way I recommend from what I've learned over the years. There's a place called Hippocrates Health Institute here in West Palm Beach, Florida. And they have what I believe is teaching it the right way. Uh, a lot of sprouts, a lot of sprouting. And I would teach people how to sprout. It's delicious. Try to grow your own food if you could. 
Uh, and, you know, I love fruit. I eat fruit. I think it's wonderful. But uh, overeating anything is no good. And I see a lot of people overeating on fruit. So you, you're, you're not as bad if you overeat on fruit as overeating on cheese. But still, overeating is overeating. So it can lead to problems. So my goal is to give my body the most nutrients while taking in the least amount of energy to get those nutrients. And a lot of processed food has a lot of toxins. The body has to work harder to get less. I want the body to work less to get more. And I am an advocate also of fasting. I I, I do intermediate fasting now, but I used to do fasting one day a week for a, a long time. On the Sabbath, I used to fast uh, and uh, for a couple of years. But now... Uh, I just, you know, I do intermittent fasting where I stop eating at a certain time and I don't eat again until the next day, a certain time. Mm. Uh, I'm also a big advocate of juicing as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so could, could you please, uh, for people who don't know, could you please uh, outline the approach of uh, Hippocrates Health Institute and what is their approach to raw foods? Because it's not sure. like, if, I guess it's not a fruitarian approach. It's something different, I guess. Yeah, right? it's not a fruitarian approach, but uh, I want to, uh, let me just comb my beard here. So <laughs> just fine. working in the garden. So uh, <laughs> most people different. comb their hair, hair but I have to comb my beard. <laughs> uh, well, Hippocrates Health Institute is more of a place that people go to when they uh, have a disease that doctors had given up on. So they're they're doing a little bit different viewpoint so than 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 other people, but uh, a lot of people that go there have cancer in later stages, and they don't believe feeding feeding uh, any sugar because sugar will feed the cancer. So if somebody has cancer, especially later stage cancer, they eliminate all fruit from the diet. Uh, so we got when we hear that, we got to say, well, who are they catering to? They're catering to people that are mostly sick already. Uh, I myself am not sick now, but I went there when I got better. And I think what their approach is wonderful. So I do include fruit in my diet, but they're very much into sprouts. They get their protein from the highest protein source you can, which is uh, which is bean sprouts, uh, different types of legume sprouts. And very easy to make at home. They also are introducing, uh, they, they use wheatgrass juice as a big part of their healing uh, which started from Ann Wigmore and uh, a lady from Lithuania who uh, healed herself with wheatgrass. And then they, they're into sunflower sprouts. They're into the buckwheat sprouts and pea sprouts. So sprouts are a big part of their diet. It gives the protein. It gives the, the mineral with the greens. And then they have, for the people that don't have uh, sugar-related diseases, they might give them a small amount of fruit maybe once or twice a week. And then they have their, you know, their salads and, and their salad greens and things like this. Now, the Ann Wigmore Institute, which started from a Parker's Health Institute, will include fermented drinks like uh, they might have something called Rejuvalac, which is a fermented drink. Uh, but Hippocrates doesn't include that in their diet. Uh, so, yeah, so that's the gist of the Hippocrates diet. Very interesting. And they're still they're still they're still available. They're in West Palm Beach, Florida, and they're still in practice. They're right near me, a couple of miles from my house. And a lot of people still go there and it's wonderful. The food's great. I go I go there and I enjoy their meals. It's really nice. Nice, nice. Now, Paul, um one I also wanted to ask uh, what would be your advice uh, in terms of aging when a person reaches their forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, like what would be in your opinion, what would be the main aspects to pay attention to? Well, I think if somebody's I think it's always good to think about this, but you you know, every investment you make in your health is gonna be an investment for your future. So what you're doing right now is an investment in your future, not now. I mean, yes, now also, but, you know, we should start thinking about aging much at a much younger age. Uh, so we could, so when we are 40, 50 years old, we don't look that old, but we start thinking about 50, we start thinking about age. Well, you can, you can do, you can do a lot also, but for me, sleeping and exercising are the two keys besides eating, sleeping and exercise and getting the proper amount of sleep so the body could do what it was designed to do. And exercising is something that a lot of people are lacking and I believe prolongs our aging. So I think exercising is wonderful. And all this from a physical standpoint, I still, uh, there's a whole spiritual com com complex to this. 
But from a physical standpoint, sleeping and exercising are extremely important when it comes to aging or not aging. And and yeah, mm-hmm. you people would find it hard to believe, but without this white beard. I mean, I'm I'm in my 80s now. Without this white beard, I'd pass for like maybe 40 or something. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not <laughs> yeah. in my 80s. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, but no, really. If I didn't have this beard, I mean, I I I, I just cut my a lot a lot of hair. But I, I it's really it does prolong uh, or prolong. It slows down the aging process when you're eating healthy and living healthy. Cool. And what's your age, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? I am 52 years old. Okay, okay, interesting. Now, I also wanted to ask, because you have lots of experience with raw foods, have you had, during this time, have you had any dental issues, or and what would be your advice in terms of um, keeping our teeth well in general? Well, uh, keeping your teeth well is good hygiene, you know, brushing your teeth, flossing, water pick, uh, as for dental issues, I mean, when I was younger, I had uh, some uh, chip teeth and I got some crowns later on. Uh, but at one time I have a lot of, I had a lot of cavities in my mouth. I have a lot of cavities and I have amalgam of fillings, but I took them all out and I got them replaced. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, I, I never had major issues with the dental thing, you know, and, but you could still get cavities on a raw diet. I still get cavities every now and then, but mm-hmm. uh I know like, some people that eat a terrible diet and they never get cavities. It's quite mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, but the things like gum inflammation and other things like that, you have you didn't have those kind of. No, things. it's quite interesting. I mean, maybe a year ago, my gums. I woke up one day; they were swollen tremendously, and I had no idea what was going on, and I was quite concerned. And after waiting for a couple of days. I spoke to Dr. Fred Bishy, who's been, he's like in his 90s and he's been eating a raw food diet for a long time. He says, what I would do is I would fast. And if you fast and it goes away, then it was something you ate. Or maybe something got stuck in your gums or something. But if, if not, then maybe it's something else. Well, I fasted for uh, for two days and it completely went away. Never had an issue before and never had an issue after that. Uh, so that was quite interesting. I don't think it had anything to do with the raw raw diet. I don't know what, what, what to this day, I don't know what it was, but it was very interesting. And over the years, n- no issues at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, guys, do you have any questions at this stage of our interview? You're welcome to unmute yourself and ask, because later on, I would like to switch our conversation to more of the spiritual side. But meanwhile, let's cover the physical, like the food side. So, guys, please feel free to unmute yourself. We have a good audience today. So ask your questions if you want me. Yes, Revital, do you have a question? Um, Regarding osteoporosis, you spoke about teeth. Do you have any, like, aging, the aging uh, problems? Like, do you have any tips for that? It's quite interesting because... uh... Osteoporosis is a problem amongst uh, people. I don't know how much so the the vegan diet versus the non-vegan diet will 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 be the cause of this. Uh, I think uh, we want to make sure we're getting the nutrients we need. I think osteoporosis is a, a a disease of malnutrition, whether somebody's eating vegan or not vegan. So you want to make sure, you know, you monitor it and you make it taking the right supplements. But exercise is tremendously important. I know people that actually reverse their arthritis. I mean, I'm sorry, their osteoporosis by doing a muscle building, strengthening exercises. They literally reversed it, which is almost unheard of. But it's very important for people, I all people, but especially people on a, a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, to make sure they're doing uh, muscle resistance exercises. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, anyone else? We got the question from Boaz, one of the group members. I transferred it for to you. A question for Paul. I'm currently in relatively good health looking to improve and want to start with juice fast and later switch to raw food. My fear is what will happen if I decide after a few months or a year on, on the diet to stop? 
can there be damages? At the time, I was doing paleo, and when I stopped, I gained 50 kilos as a result of an uncontrollable hunger for sugars. So do you have anything well, to say about that? I never recommend people uh, doing these yo-yo diets where they, they do it for a while, and then they stop, and they go back and forth. Going back and forth could be more dangerous than, than not doing it at all. I'd rather see somebody being less than perfect and being consistent than somebody going up and down. One day they're perfect or one month they're perfect and one month they're not. But <clears throat> as you get into a healthier state by eating uh, raw foods the correct way, it can be very dangerous to go back, not just to cook food, but to meat, extremely dangerous if you go back to meat. It's a recipe for disease. It's much more dangerous to go raw for a couple of years and then go back to eating animal products. It's very dangerous. And Dr. Fred Bishy talks about this all the time. Uh, if if you don't think you're going to stay the way you, where you are, don't do it. You're better off not doing it. Uh, so you got to look at what your goals are too. Like I said, why do you, why do you start it to begin with? Are you trying to accomplish something short term or do you know it's the best way to eat long term? And why would you not? continue doing it you know if if so these are questions you need to ask yourself but i'd be very cautious to if you think you might go back is to not start it uh to, you know you could eat more raw food in your diet but i wouldn't go all raw if you think there's a chance you're going to go back good answer okay guys do you have any more questions so, Paul, I, I wanted to ask you, um, do you think, uh, it's a more on the spiritual side, do you think that uh, too much engagement in food matters, in health matters, in cleansing matters might become an obsession and become kind of an idol worship in itself? Absolutely. Uh, people uh, make an idol out of their food today. And at least the God I follow and believe in says nothing should be more important than me. But people aren't worshiping the the creator of the food. They're worshiping the food. <laughs> it seems. And that's a big problem. So, uh, you know, idolization of all things is a, is a big issue from a spiritual standpoint. From a food standpoint, there's so many diseases, physical diseases that are attached to overeating and eating unhealthy food. It, it's a tremendous thing we got to get hold of. And uh, set, uh, Ellen White, uh, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, has great books on health. And a lot of her books talk about temperance, which is, uh, it's not moderation, it's temperance. They're kind of like two different things. So we, we need to have uh, temperance or control over, over, over all things, but especially our eating. You can't not overeat. And it, it can extremely impact our health uh, on every level. So I think it's important to, to know your limits and not, not, overdo them and that's hard because the world pushes to eat more and more and more and it's a big issue so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay paul now i also wanted to ask uh, you to tell us maybe briefly or not so briefly uh how how did you what like what was your spiritual develop spiritual path and how you uh having jewish background how how did you start believing in yeshua and like what was your path to that and and on a, on more broad, in a more broad sense, uh, like um, which role your faith plays today in your overall well-being and health? Sure. When I was 19 years old, I got uh, sick uh, with uh, my stomach, and I was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, also known as ulcer ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And even though both my parents were Jewish, uh, they didn't practice the Jewish faith growing up. They were very secular. But they left it up to me to believe what I wanted to believe. And I was more of an atheist than anything else. I was always involved in sports. And I just wanted to be the best I could be at, at the competitive sports that I played. Uh, but when I got the diagnosed with an illness, it changed my mind about everything. And I started to look at all the different belief systems of the world. And, uh, and then during my healing, uh, I, I, I met a man who told me that World's greatest book that ever written was the Bible, the best health book ever written. I said, well, uh, uh, you know, are there people that eat raw food in there? Absolutely, there are. Matter of fact, God says in Genesis 129, the food for man is fruits and vegetables. 
Are there old old living people there? The oldest people of the world are living are there, and you know, so so of all the aspects, does it talk about the importance of rest, health, sleep, water, air, sunlight, and all that? Absolutely, it does. So I got the Bible, and I didn't know where to start reading, and somebody told me to start reading in the Gospel of John. So I started rather reading the Gospel of John, and I got halfway through that, and I accepted Yeshua, the one they called Jesus, as my Messiah, because. There's no other prophet in the world that's bringing people back from the dead, <laughs> including himself. Uh, just absolutely amazing information. So even though I technically got better when I wasn't following the Bible, I believe today, I'm always a, been a disciplined person, but I believe uh, just like the Bible says that when Jesus departed, he left us a helper called the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Holy Spirit helps me in times where uh, I can't do something on my own, you know, unlike all the other belief systems of the world, you know, they tell you to do something, to do something, to do something, and they believe in this false idea of karma. Uh, but Yeshua, Jesus, didn't say that. He said, I'm going to help you do this. I'm going to guide you, and I'm going to be there with you. So it, it's a it's a tremendous stress of me knowing I am the one physically that has to do certain things, but I'm not the one in control, complete control of the situation he is. And it just brings me joy to know that I'm not going at this all alone. It's a wonderful thing. Interesting. So in, so what does it mean to be to live according to the Bible for you? Uh, to live according to the Bible is basically... Uh, our creator's given us the guidelines and instructions. Uh, hold on, keep me updated there. Uh, the the basically the guidelines and instructions that our creator uh gives us is for our benefit to keep us safe, to keep us healthy. And I want to discover, learn, and continually to study the words of our creator to know uh, what's the best way that I could live to achieve the goal of, of not only here physically on earth, but, but also the so-called afterlife to know uh, how I can secure my spot in, in heaven. But while I'm here, I want to live according to the wisest instructions that are out there. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to study the Bible, study the word and try to follow it because I believe and trust that he's my creator. And he says in his word, know the plans I have for you. They are for good and not disaster to give me a future, give me a hope. And I want to believe that. Very interesting. Guys, do you have any questions? Okay. Yes, Rebecca. Uh, I just remember it's it's uh, not related to the spiritual uh, path. Um, about parasites, do you have any uh, yeah, cool. many many of diseases man suffer from today is from parasites, actually. Uh, I think cleansing is healthy to do a parasite cleanse if somebody, especially if somebody's suffering from an illness, is important. Thankfully to uh, the, uh, the study and everything else out there today of science and everything else, uh, we know how to identify when there's some parasite infection or so on. And I think there are, there's many different cleanses out there of how to cleanse yourself if you do have a parasite, but uh, definitely should be looked at if somebody's experiencing any negative health. But you also want to look at their lifestyle too. If they make those lifestyle changes and they're still suffering, chances are it uh, could be related to a parasite. But if somebody's living an unhealthy lifestyle, even if they get rid of the parasites, they're still going to be in trouble. So I recommend living the best we could live with the idea of having an open mind about cleansing the body. And do you have any uh, specific uh, protocol you would recommend? Or? Uh, I sell on my website something called the Ajuva Herbal Cleanse, which is really nice. Uh, they put together this three-week full-body cleanse that helps. And they also have a parasite cleanse as well that are nice. But thankfully so, because of the study of herbs and everything else, there's a lot of health food stores that have really good parasite cleanses out there. And uh, on the internet, it's a lot of good information about black walnut and clove and all these other parasite cleansing things you could take. So, I mean, 
it's an important topic. I would work with an herbalist if if I knew somebody had a parasite cleanse to find out for what particularly they're dealing with, what herbs might be the best and just take those and apply those. But I like the Ajuva cleanse because they put it together in a nice program that helps people go along and, and, and go with that. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Can you give me one second? I'll be back in one second. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Guys, meanwhile, do you have any more questions? Don't be shy because I have a lot. Um, you... I might have one. Hi. Sure, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So so once, uh, Paul, Ravital, did you finish with yours? Yeah, it's okay. okay. Cool. If, something, if something comes up, then... Uh, yeah, 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 feel free. You know, it's not a formal meeting. It's just a friendly chat. So guys, please, please feel free. Don't be shy. Yes, Russo, uh, once Paul comes back, we'll... Yeah, and anyone else? Anyone else has any okay. questions? Okay, Ru, so uh, please unmute yourself. You had more questions. Uh, yeah, hi, hi, Paul. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I just had, I found it quite intriguing, um, your, uh, the way you speak about the spirituality, and it sounds like Christianity and the Bible really spoke to you. Um, firstly, my question um I mean, what what would you do if you're not? I mean, I have a Bible. I wouldn't say that uh, I feel that drawn to it the way that your faith is with you, and that that's okay. But like, yeah, just, just um, I suppose I guess it's you know possible with any faith. Um, you're specifically speaking from Christian. I mean, I wish I had that. I wish I had that faith that you have. Um, and then secondly, I, I don't know if that is a question, <laughs> maybe it is. But then the second thing I wondered was, um, how do you, when, a, when a, a certain food or behavior like caffeine, for example, or could be another substance has a real stronghold, how do you use your faith? Um, is it just like prayer in terms of words or is there any action that you take to follow that? prayer process i mean okay. what does that look like rather than i don't mean to sound oh god disrespectful but i just can't think of another way of saying but rather than it just being words you know yeah, absolutely like, absolutely so great great question great question and I'll, I'll tell you first of all i don't name or have a particular like religion that i'm part of i i believe i'm a, I'm a history buff i love history and and I, I just love history. And as I study uh, history of the world, I find out the original Testament, the old covenant or uh, uh, the old Testament, the Bible spots they found in Israel that are mentioned in the Bible. I mean, they're right where they were. It's absolutely amazing. It lines up perfectly. If they say, well, this church was here or this event happened here, they literally found Noah's Ark in, in the mountains of Turkey. And it's been confirmed. So uh, I, I'm still a human and I need to see the proof before I sometimes believe in something. Um, but then even when I got to the death of Yeshua or Jesus, I mean, it wasn't something somebody just wrote about. There were hundreds of eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Uh, now there are some people that believe maybe he's just a prophet or is he the savior or is he the Messiah? And and, and these could be all discussed with but but there's no doubt that okay he rise rose from the dead i mean that was that was a historical event not like some fiction story uh for me so i don't prescribe really to the the so-called christian faith or christianity because they don't fully follow the bible they follow half of the bible but they don't follow the 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 torah the the first five books which is the foundation of all scripture that even the people, it says in the Bible, all scripture is profitable for man. Uh, and and when the people of the New Testament wrote about this, there was no New Testament. They were reading the Torah. So I, I believe the Torah has the instructions and guidelines our Creator wants to, us to live by. As for my faith or how that plays in my discipline, well, even before I ever picked up the Bible, I've always been a disciplined person. I've always been one to accomplish. I was already eating a raw food diet for 10 years before I even found the Bible. So I've always been a disciplined person. Now, I, I, I grew up in New York City uh, and I had, you know, we all have our in, in our childhood growing up, the type of 
I didn't get everything handed to me. So I had to work for what I wanted. And I've just always been disciplined. And what I have found from my experience is everyone's disciplined for what they truly love. I know people that say, oh, I don't have the discipline to eat raw food every day or to resist caffeine. But that same person might love dogs and they might wake themselves up out of bed at 4 a.m. every morning, even on a cold, rainy day to walk their dog or let their dog out. So they're disciplined for what they truly love. Uh, but it does come into a challenge when where you get physically addicted to certain things. From a spiritual standpoint, I do believe in spiritual warfare, and I do believe there's the forces of good and evil that are continuously battling and things we don't see. And that's where prayer helps me tremendously because uh, it says there's a battle going on for our souls all the time that's not necessarily seen. I am always in prayer with my creator, which just doesn't mean words. I'm talking to him, just like he's my best friend. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to him consistently. I'm listening to him consistently. And he's not just talking audibly, but he's also talking through his word, through other people and everything else. But that combined with my discipline grounding that I already have will help me to resist certain things. I've never tasted, uh, I never had a cup of coffee in my life. I know caffeine was bad for me. I always wanted to be the best as possible at sports. So what I would suggest to you is uh, look at what your ultimate goal is. If a person is not suffering from a, a disease or any health challenges, they have no reason to ch make a change at all. But when you are experiencing some health challenge, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to keep, keep getting the same result. So if you know whether it's caffeine, alcohol, drugs, or something else is contributing to your problem, now you have to find a way to overcome that. And it's not a nutritional question. It's not a spiritual question. It's a question of discipline. How can we be more disciplined? And you could apply that to any area of life. And my answer would be is to love the result you want more than you love the flavor or the taste or the way something makes you feel. Because if you love the way it, you taste for those few minutes of pleasure, you, you might not be willing and able to give it up. But if you love the result you're going to get by not doing that more than the taste, then that would be able to help you. Does that make sense? Oh, completely. Yeah, completely. And I think that um, going to these foods or caffeine and, you know, sometimes in a state of boredom and, you know, discontent and normally that, well, that's where faith that uh, could be helpful or spiritual practice could be helpful um but you know um it's it's not as simple i mean it's it's great when people have that strong calling towards a particular faith or and i like what you said that you know not not following the christian religion as such that that really is quite uh, hopeful to hear <laughs> um just because i mean it's your personal you know walk and relationship with you know, um, with with God or Jesus it's through that the Bible and it's your process and um, yeah, so it's just you know filling that kind of empty <laughs> kind of well. If I if I might if I might say, ma'am, uh, in the Bible we're commanded to be to to, to be in a state of joy. Our Creator right. wants us to be in a state of joy, and He's given us all those things to be in that state. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I know immediately when somebody says they're depressed or, or or they're acting in depression, possibly bored. I don't use the word bored too much, but if somebody's depressed, they're going through a spiritual battle because our creator would not allow that to happen in our life or give that to a life. And that's not just something I think. This is what the word says. You know, and this, you know, and again, the historical information confirms the word is correct. So I do think there's there's definitely something missing in people's lives when they're bored and depressed and things like this. And it's, it's, it's an understandable thing because the way most people are brought up, but there, there's more than enough for us to be happy about. And, and also to, to fill our lives that even if we didn't have a spiritual connection, we should be so busy trying to accomplish our goals and have so much joy with the possible result that we don't have time to, to mess around with these other things. But uh, when the negative forces of the unseen world come in and they and they distract us to to do things that we shouldn't be doing or or be messing around with things we shouldn't be messing around, then it gets quite challenging. And I understand the chemical addiction to certain foods. I understand the chemical addiction to caffeine and also drugs and alcohol. Once somebody takes it once, 
You know, it's like the alcoholic that goes to the bar to drink away their problems. It gives them that temporary relief of nothing's wrong because they just go numb on every area of their life. So now they realize what they did was wrong, but they 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 remember that feeling, so they go back for more alcohol. Same thing with the person that does drugs. Same thing with the person that does caffeine. They're looking for their answer somewhere else, not you know where they should be looking. And they're trying to put it on the food. And some people do it with TV. They'll just get themselves numb by watching TV. They try to forget all their problems and everything else. And I think what our cre uh, creator says and what he wants to understand is they're not really problems. We shouldn't be searching for a way to escape our problems. We should be looking for solutions. And, you know, and I just say, well, how are we going to get out of this one? Or what am I going to do? And, you know, he doesn't want me to be sad about it. You know, we create most of our problems, you know, and uh, so, you know, it's just a matter of, of just life and figuring it out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good. You're welcome. Good. Anyone else, guys? Okay, Paul. Now I I'm just curious because you said that you uh, yes, Robert. I'll, now I I just got some one question and then you will go after me. So um, you said that you um, you do not consider yourself like belonging to a Christian religion or something like that. But on the other hand, you do have your Christian ministry. So does it belong to any particular denomination, or you have created your own denomination, or how does it work? Well, I, I don't really use the word Christian ministry. I mean, the name of my ministry is Torah Life Ministries. Mm. <laughs> it's uh, so, you know, the reason why, I mean, people would consider me Christian is because I believe in Yeshua as the Messiah. Uh, but I, I don't think the Christian church is following uh, all of the words in scripture. But I would identify myself as a Christian because I believe in Yeshua. But uh, as you very well know, and a lot of people know, the first believers were Christ were Jewish brothers. Uh, Yeshua, Jesus, went to the Jewish people, not to the, not to anyone else, and he spoke to them. And two thirds of them denied him who he says he was, but there was one third that accepted him, and and started following him. And they didn't call themselves Christians. The word Christians isn't even really used in Scripture. And they were followers of the way, the way of uh, of God through Yeshua. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't, the, the denomination I have is is reading the Bible and trying to figure it out and working with it. But I, I you know, I still acknowledge though that, you know, my heritage, my, my both my parents are Jewish, even though they were very secular. Uh, that's my heritage, but my, my path is the historical evidence to prove that the word of God is true. And I'm going to do my best to uh, try to figure it out and also pray and ask God, what am I doing wrong if I'm not getting the results that I think he wants me to have, not that I want to have. Wonderful. Yes, Ravital, please ask your question. Um, I don't know if it's a question, you know, what, what's happening now in the world? Of what can we do about it? like Agenda 2021, Agenda 2030, like we're seven years away and it's scary. So uh, what can we do? I mean, what do you think? Good question. Well, Good question. Like, like people are uh, thinking about it. Many people can become desperate, like kind of lost. So what, yeah, I, I well, would also like, like to ask you this question. I, I don't know about these different agendas and, and, and what, they all call for, but I do know all throughout the history of man, they were in a similar situation. I mean, we think, oh, the end times are upon us now because all this stuff goes on. Prophecy has never been completely filled and it still hasn't been uh, completely filled in scripture. If you want to hold what's going on in the world now to scripture, there's still a lot of things that still need to happen before we come to a certain time. However, uh, you could take people, uh, ever since the time of, of Yeshua Jesus, people thought that that was the last generation, but then another generation rose. And even now, in more recent times, in the in the 70s, you had uh, a revolution, and then the 80s, you had uh, the AIDS epidemic, and then in the 90s, you had all this stuff coming about 2000, and then now you have all this other stuff, and, and, and you know, and people have two choices, you know, they, you know, of how they want to handle these different things. I don't, acknowledge that we're in worse times now than we were back then 
you know, there's more stuff going on now, but, you know, but we also have more defenses and, and information now as well. So I'm not, you know, the Bible doesn't want us to live in a state of fear. It's actually, that's, that's of the enemy. The Bible says we are not to fear man. We are not to fear any of these things. Uh, the Bible is to live in a state of joy and, 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 and have inner shalom and peace. It's the highest level of spirituality any person can obtain in this level of where we are right now in the world. It's having peace and shalom amongst all the chaos in the world. And it's a beautiful thing. You take in the Bible, King David, for example, uh, people were trying to kill him all the time. His own son was trying to kill him. And it says he put his head down and he slept. You know, if people try to kill me, I'm not getting much sleep. I'm going to be looking out and worried and scared and all this stuff. So I still have a lot of work to do. But it shows you a level of uh, peace that and trusting that we can be at. And I think the world's going to continue to get worse. Things are going to continue to get worse. But we shouldn't continue to get worse. We should try to be mature in our spiritual walk where we have that peace and that shalom. And there are a lot of people that have it. And I try to surround myself with those type of people, uh, you know, and, and I'm not into, there's a lot of unproven theories around the world of why certain things are happening and everything else, but, you know, live in a, in a, in a, in a loving way and deal with what comes and, uh, but don't get depressed and give up because that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to give up, but stay strong and, and, Set an example for others. And I think everyone on this panel here asking these questions and listening right now has a really special, unique place. And our creator has put you there for a reason because you're most likely at least interested in health on every level, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And I'm sure there's people in all your lives that that aren't. And uh, you, you have a, a role to play in their lives where you can teach them either through example without even saying a word or by talking to them and teaching them and letting them know. I mean, fasting is one of the greatest things we could do for our health. I think it's an amazing thing that this group fasts once a week. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. You know, people are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on medicine and machines and everything else when the greatest healing is sleeping and fasting and it's free. Uh, so, you know, people don't understand this. You know, I know people that are homeless that are more happy than people that have houses. The answer isn't in the money, the cars and the houses. You know, people in Hollywood are getting divorced more than people that aren't filled with all this money and everything else. So there's something else more behind it. And we just got to uh, figure that out and just uh, look, desire that peace and that shalom. And I, when I see people with that, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, I really like that. Okay, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. Amazing. Now, Paul, I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, um, in terms of the well-being of a person, what would be more important? What would play the more important role? The, their faith and relationship with God or all the physical factors such as food, um, exercise, etc., in terms of contribution to the general well-being? Well, I believe they go hand in hand. I believe if uh, you have uh, a great connection with our creator, you're going to want to do the best for your body. You're not going to want to disrespect your body with drugs, with bad food, and treat your body like a garbage can. Uh, if you are treating your body amazing, but you don't have faith, what you're doing is is you're putting it all, you're, you're taking the credit for everything you've learned. You're taking the credit for everything you're doing. And it's a very dangerous place to be because things might be going great in your life right now with your health. You might have learned some lessons along the way that have helped uh, helping you overcome a disease or be healthy, but it's not always going to be like that. And if you take all the credit for what you're doing, there's going to come a time where you're not going to be able to accomplish what you're doing and, and you're going to have all the responsibilities. So I think it's it's tremendously important to eat healthy and live healthy, but we must remember uh, not to worship uh, the, the food. We got to worship the creator of the food. He mm. said in his word in Genesis 29, 129, the food for man is fruits and vegetables. So even though I'm growing my fruit trees and I have hundreds of fruit trees out there, I'm thanking him every morning. I'm not standing and bowing down to the food and worshiping the food. I'm thankful I have the food, but I know who the creator is who gave me the opportunity to have the food. And I think when we 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 thankful for the food without our creator in the process, it's a very dangerous place to be. And it is idolization at that point. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So could you share could you share with us uh, this uh, practice of um, being thankful uh, before the meal or after the meal, like uh, maybe a short prayer? How do you do that if you do that? Um, so so that other people might um, um, uh, apply as well. Well, in Israel and Judaism, they have a corporate prayer for just about everything. And it's a wonderful thing. I'm a big advocate of corporate prayer. Just getting up, I'm thankful that I'm able to get up, breathe, and walk around. Uh, I'm thankful when I have food and to think about how our Creator provided for me where I could eat this food, this great food. It's it's really a wonderful thing, but it's not about just praying uh, before a meal. It's being in a consistent state of communication with a higher power. And uh, and to me, that higher power is the Creator who created the food. So just being thankful. Look, we all have a choice. You know, some people say about love. Love is a, love. Love is not an emotion. Love is a choice, and it's a fact. You know, love is not an emotion. It's a choice. Effectuation, that's an emotion, <laughs> and a lot of people mix effectuation and love. Uh, so you know, there's a difference between happiness and joy. Joy happen happiness is something that comes from the outside, based on what another person does will determine if we're happy or unhappy. That's the word happy or happen. But joy comes from the inside. So regardless of what's going on around me, I could be at a state of joy. You know, it's not based on what they're doing. So most of the world is is living life based on what the world is doing. So they live in a life either a happy state or an unhappy state based on what other people are doing. Basically, other people have control of them. But when you understand the difference between happiness and joy and joy come from the inside, regardless of what's going on around me, I've made my choice the way I want to live and I'm going to stick to it and, and feel blessed for it. Uh, so I think that's a big difference and important thing people need to understand. Yeah. So if I understand you right, correctly, uh, the point is not to um, have like a specific prayer before or after the meal, but just to be in a certain state of connection with God and communication with God on a regular basis. So that's that's what you meant? No, no. I'm a big advocate of uh, what I call corporate prayer. It is having mm. a standard prayer to do. And if you could do it with others, it's a wonderful thing, a wonderful public acknowledgement of our creator to be there for one another and do that. So I think praying uh, before a meal, if I'm alone and I pray before a meal silently, that's wonderful. But when I'm in others, I think it's important uh, to pray openly out loud, a prayer that we all understand and know together and we're all thankful for it. So prayer can be very personal and should be very personal, but at the same time, there's nothing wrong with people having a standard pr prayer for, this is the prayer I do before I go to sleep, this is the prayer I do when I wake up. Uh, and this has been the oldest uh, thing that's been around in the world with the Jewish people doing the prayers from the time all the way back from Abraham in the scriptures and even beyond that. So I think it's very helpful. And it's great to know that the prayer I'm doing is the same prayer that Yeshua himself might have given, like on the Sabbath or something else. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to know that. I'd love to learn Hebrew and do it in the language. That would be even more blessing. But uh, prayer on every level is important. And we have to be careful not to just do our own I mean, a personal prayer is important, uh, sharing our hearts and our feelings, but not to do it without acknowledging who we're speaking to, not just on some level of, well, I'm just going to say these words, because then we put it all on ourselves, and selfishness is the opposite of humbleness, and uh, we need to humble ourselves, and, and, and we do that when we acknowledge that we're not the ones that are ultimately in control. Right, right. Now, uh, another person from the group he sent he sent quite a lot of questions i'm just going to be picky regarding them so he's asking about uh, the um mm, what well, like what could you expand what you could what could you tell us about the food given to men in the garden of eden and the foods allowed after the fall of men because are the, those are the two different things yeah, so when man was in the Garden of Eden, they were in the world's best health food store they could ever be in. They were surrounded <laughs> by the world's best food. It was absolutely amazing. It was a beautiful environment. They didn't need temporary air filters. The air was great. The place was great. But if you're if you're in a you go to your local health food store and you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, they kick you out of the store and they put your name on a list and they banned you from coming back in that store. Well, you, now you don't have access to this amazing environment, this amazing place. So you got to find out 
well, what's available now? Where can I go? And you got to do the best with what's available for you. Well, Adam and Eve were in the greatest position uh, people can be, but they didn't follow our creator and they got kicked out of the garden. So then they had to do the next best thing and and and, and to survive and do the best they can do. Then uh, we got a second chance during the times of Noah to repent. And the Bible says repentance brings refreshing. A lot of people don't understand what uh, repentive, being repentive is. And it's absolutely amazing. Uh, it's, it's changing your mind of the way you're going to live your lives. So at the time of Noah, the people had a chance to do that. But uh, nobody listened. And then the flood came and destroyed everything, including the fruits and vegetables. Garden of Eden was flooded as well. Everything was flooded at that point. And now, uh, you know, God gave man permission to eat animals. Uh, and he just said, don't eat the blood. But he still gave man permission to eat animals at that point. There was nothing else they could eat. So then uh, the olive showed up and the fruits and vegetables came back. So man had a choice at that point. Do I want to go back to eating the way he intended me to eat in the first place and design my body to eat? Or do I want to continue eating uh, the animals? And uh, most people, we know the choice they're making. They're eating the animals. It's very interesting. The lifespan of man declined tremendously after the flood. You know, so uh, people today are still eating the animals. And our creator says in his word, do not be a drunkard or a glutton. Do not overconsume food. Most people, and I think it's the biggest problem when it comes to health, is people are overeating. Now we can look at what are they overeating on? They're overeating on these animals. And it's making their health even worse. And with all technology and everything else, the life can the lifespan continues to decline. And people always say, no, it's better than ever. We're living later than we ever lived. No, we're not living anywhere close to what was at biblical times. But we are living longer now than we had in the past. But I don't call it living, I call it barely surviving. Because people are living to older ages, but they're in hospitals. <laughs> so we're not necessarily living, uh, the lifespan isn't bestly gotten better, but we got to do the best we could do with what we got. And, you know, fruits and vegetables are still available to us. We don't need to eat animal meat or drink animal milk to be, to be healthy. Matter of fact, you know, more science has proven that that will decline our health and speed up our aging more than anything else. So overeating, eating the foods that we weren't designed to eat because we were designed physically to eat fruits and vegetables is the way we should go, I believe. Okay. Okay. By the way, in your community, in your ministry, do you um, like oblige people to follow a certain like dietary lifestyle or anything like that? Well, what I've learned over the years, uh, just telling people what to do isn't going to really work. Right. Uh, I, uh, what I do tell people to do is to do what's working for them. And I try to teach them to realize if it's working for them or not. So I would tell you or somebody else, if they say, well, I want to give up meat. I like eating meat or I like doing this. I say, look, do what's working for you. But the question now becomes is, how do you know that's working for you? So I, I give them the sign that if they have uh, no sickness, if they feel amazing, if, they, if they're going to the bathroom, okay, they're getting good sleep. They're not living in fear. They're doing all these things. They have no reason to change. But most people bring up something to do with health or diet or something. I don't. They bring it up. Why do you eat that way? Or blah, 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 this or that. Well, I eat this way and so on. Everyone's looking to better themselves. You know, so it's like do what's working for you. But if you think something could work better, why wouldn't you try it? So I, I, I let people come to their own conclusion of, hey, maybe... You know, this guy definitely has more energy than me. Maybe I should start eating that way. But breaking those addictions, it, it could be a challenge for some people. But uh, that's why the whole discipline thing has to, you know, you got to stick to your decisions. Interesting. Guys, do you have any more questions? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I, Frederick. I, yeah, because of if... my voice, mm -hmm. I have just written it on the chat. It's not even true. I, I, I can't get the whole thing done. But the whole the question is about divorce. You find that uh, this world in which we live in today, this generation, the way I can call it, has too many divorces. People live two, three, four years, divorce. Marry another one, marry after some few years again, divorce. Yes, there's the issue of infidelity. But what is causing this? What is the root cause of infidelity? 
I don't see the Bible. I don't see the Bible from our patriarchs in the, in the Old Testament, the way they live. That kind of a thing. It's not a pattern of the Bible. Sure, brother. Sure. Did we lose his voice or did he finish his question? I, I, I got an answer. You still there, Frederick? No, I think he finished. Actually, um, yes, he, yes okay. Frederick. So, mm -hmm. so I'll answer so the whole, question. Okay. The whole thing is, what is the root cause? What we can call the remedy? What for? Okay. You know, obviously, we can't secure, we can't uh, save the entire world, but at least we can. Those people who are, who want to get the solution can somehow listen to the wisdom. This is a very important question, and this is what I. I think about and teach about often is relationships. And this is why we have this problem, brother. And I'll tell you right now, the Bible teaches us the role of man and the role of women. That's what it teaches us. And they're all equally as important. The world today is teaching us the opposite. The world today is teaching us uh, we're all equal in every single area of life. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says there's a role for man and there's a role for women, there's a role for children, and this is how it to live. The problem is the teaching of the world today, which is teaching people, uh, they don't have any roles. See, the Bible calls it a covering. So uh, the children got their covering being the parents. The wife has his covering being the husband. The husband have his covering, and it goes on and on and on. And when you get out of that covering, you're putting yourself in a very dangerous place right now. So in today's world, women are taught through feminism uh, that they don't need a man and they can survive without a man. The Bible teaches the opposite and the world shows the opposite. Men are getting out of their role as men because they're told to be leaders or protectors or providers. And men are choosing not to do that. So they're getting out of their biblical role of creation of who they're supposed to be so between the feminism that's promoted in the world today and the, uh, the demasculizing of men today we're running into this problem now that we never had before in the history divorce is becoming so prevalent it's becoming so normal it's becoming just an average thing even in the church because they're not following the biblical words look let me put it this way the most submissive person in all the bible was jesus Jesus was the most submissive person in all of Scripture. The Bible teaches us to submit to our covering, and it's a positive, healthy thing. But today, the word submission has become a curse word. You know, and it's a bad thing. We're supposed to be submissive to God. You know, even at the word slave, you know, we hear such a connotation of slave because we know what man has done with that word. But we're to be slaves to God, and it's a beautiful thing. And even in the Bible, the Hebrew slaves took care of the Hebrew slaves. You know, it was more of a providing. It wasn't more of like a controlling thing. But men and women have gotten out of their biblical roles. They've walked away from their spiritual covering. And the enemy's having their way with people today. And divorce is a terrible thing. But, you know, this is the way men and women are trained today. And it's a big problem. And if you go to communities or cultures around the world that are still living under their biblical cover, they don't have the same type of problems with divorce or relationships. And I'll be honest with you, there's only uh, a, a few cultures around the world that still have that. And they're fighting for it. But you can tell, and this is the greatest way, you can tell by the, the, the marriage and relationships are the greatest way you can tell of how a person's living. And Christians are getting divorced just as much as non-Christians, so Christians aren't following their biblical covering. But there are still some cultures around the world, and if you want me to go further, I'll talk about those cultures where they are following uh, and the, the, the higher covering, and they're blessed for it, and divorce is at a very low level in those places around the world. So this is a great question and an important question because I think it reveals the truth about how people are choosing to live or have been trained and molded to live. And I think uh, through feminism and the demasculizing of men to be leaders, uh, the world is where it is today. 
and especially relationships are a great mark to show that. You go to any community around the world where there's a very little divorce to no divorce, where divorce is shunned on and looked as a bad thing, and you have men and women living according to their spiritual covering, you'll see a, a completely different uh, society and also in the way children are brought up in those societies. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, brother. Yes, Robita. Uh, it's yeah, it's very interesting uh what you just said and what you said before. It's like um everything is up abnormal in terms of eating, in terms of relationships, yeah. like um gluttony. Uh, forget forget about animals and animal products. What about all the processed food that is very addict? I don't know, McDonald's, it's plastic. I don't know if it's food. What is it made of? Chemicals and plastic and, and uh, it's very addictive and people overeat and uh, yeah, um, the way society is, it's all distorted now. They want to uh, teach children about sexuality in, in the, the educational system. You know, everything is twisted and everything is distorted and uh, in, in every aspect of life. And that's why uh, we're so sick, both uh, physically and, and the society is sick and there are all kinds of diseases and, and, and abnormal situations psychologically, socially, yeah. physically. The society is sick. Everyone is sick uh, physically. Yeah. M mental disease in the world today is a result of the de uh, uh, masculinity of men and the uh, feminization of, of, of the world today. This is where the mental disease comes in. And it's a bad thing. You can look at animals in nature. When I was learning about health and nutrition, you know, I learned the only animals that got the same disease as humans were the ones that they were giving a human food to. You know, the ha domestic house cats and domestic dogs were getting cancers, but animals in the wild weren't getting cancers. You know, it's it's what they were trained to do and what they were doing. Well, it's the same thing on every level. You know, you can go and look at the animal kingdom and you don't have this craziness. You have the 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 leaders you have the 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 alpha and the mega uh, you know males and females and the way the whole society runs there wasn't the intellectual of the of the media or the you know internet or something else telling people to act different than who they were you see so there's like an identity crisis first of all from a physical standpoint we were we were created to be vegetarian we were created to be vegans that's the way we were created. But there's this identity crisis because people think they're meat eaters now. So people are eating animals. And so they're doing something that they weren't designed to do. And there's going to be some type of impact from that. The same thing you can go continue to go down that road of, of, of women were created a certain way. Men were created a certain way. But, you know, because of the way people are going, these things are happening. You know, and it was also, never designed to be that way with single family households and 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 all these different things. Children were supposed to have parents and the parents were supposed to be uh, a man and a woman. And this is the way it's supposed to be. But the more you got away from that, the more the mental diseases are on the rise and and the physical diseases are, are following close behind. And you got this problem. So you if like you have a father, a father who's leading his family. You know, the kid's not going to, you know, and the father knows about health and he's going to tell the kid, look, this is the food you're going to eat. This is what you're going to do. The kid's not going to sit there eating chips and get diabetes. But in today's society, the kid will say, well, dad, I'm going to eat this. And if you don't like it, I'm going to take you to court. It's absolutely crazy where a child could sue their parents. That's that's an insane in this world. And it's just as insane where, you know, a spouse can sue the other spouse. It's absolutely so far away from society. And it, it's not what the animal kingdom does. And it's not what we were meant to be doing, but we're, we're just fighting each other. And this is why the only comfort people can find is a temporary comfort in either drugs, sex, or food. It's the only temporary comfort or, or pleasure people can find. Our creator gave us a, a, a everlasting existence pleasure in peace and shalom. 
but people are running to these temporary pleasures to try to find it because they don't they don't have any peace or shalom. Yeah, it's like uh, the society is normalizing all the abnormalities <laughs> that's become becomes normal. So that's why there there's so many problems with autism and uh, transgenderism. It's like ever everything's twisted, and it it is uh, you know all the deviants, uh, all the deviations are becoming the norm, the normal, and all the normal people. <laughs> that's. Yeah, yeah but we're all we're all we're all guilty of that. I could find a fault in everyone here, including myself, because this is the way we've been brought up, you know. But instead of just pointing the finger and saying, "Well, you could do this better, you could do this better, you could do this better," let's find out. Well, what's the reason we're doing this to begin with? Why did we get here? And the answer to something isn't to keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. It's to change what we're doing. But let's go back and look at well, why do we do these things? Why are certain people? Uh, thinking this way you know so yes certain things are bad in society and and it's certainly not healthy to be drinking beer and eating meat but why do people do that well let's go back look at their their fathers and and how their fathers acted and what their fathers taught them and their father's fathers and find out where in a generation did we accept that eating meat and drinking beer is okay and then from the women's standpoint when i see a woman walking around half naked you know then you see the woman's mother and then it's like, well, now we know where she got it from. Where the mother get it from? You go back and back and back, and then you could put a connection to see, well, this is where the break came. This is where, and it was a society pressure to change the idea of the way certain things would be done to get away from the biblical covering and the spiritual covering and do things the world's way. And this is why people, you know, that's how disease got, you know, higher and higher. In Exodus fifteen twenty six in the Bible. God told the children of Israel when they go into the promised land, if you diligently follow my guidelines and instructions, I will not put the same disease upon you that I put upon the Egyptians. But if you go there and you do not follow what I say, I will give you new diseases you never even heard of yet. And in today's world, we got more study, science, and knowledge of the topic of disease than ever before in the history of man. And at the same time, we have more disease than ever before in the history of man. Why? Because people stop listening to our creator and they're listening to themselves and doing what they feel is right. And that's the problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Paul. So uh, what are the cultures that are still holding the family strong, in your opinion? Well, basically, uh, and I don't speak as a stereotype blanket to every person in these cultures, but Islam and Judaism, uh, are, are, on, as a whole, the most, especially when it comes to marriage, but as a whole, uh, are the are the two cultures where uh, men and women are sticking to their roles, and this is why we see so much less of divorce and 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 violence and issues on every single level in these two type of cultures in the world now they're starting to get away from it but for the most part uh these are the two most popular i'm not going to say there's no others but these are the two most popular cultures in the world that understand the roles of men and women and children and you don't have the same problems within these cultures as you do out of these cultures and i'm not talking about on the news or the media or something we might see that's that's uh, portrayed in a certain way. I'm talking about the really what's going on with these cultures. And uh, and that, that's the way Christianity was, maybe in the 40s and 50s. You knew they were sticking to their, their biblical roles and their spiritual covering. They weren't walking outside from under their covering or anything else. But the 60s, the revolution, the 70s, 80s, and now they, they've kind of left that idea of, you know, a man's a man, a woman's a woman. And as that happens, you see the breakdown of it all. But, you know, so those are the only two cultures that I see that are still strongly uh, promoting and following these uh, important lessons. Yeah, I can confirm that, actually, because I live in Israel in the neighborhood where you have lots of religious couples and you it's, it's just beautiful to see. You know, I'm, I'm not in, not a um, religious person like I like in terms of uh, I am. I do not. I'm set, I do not follow like the Jew, Jewish religion. I could say, but uh, it's just beautiful to see because you see, man is a man, like woman is a woman, and then they have kids, and kids are playing together. So you can really see vibrations wise, like energy wise, the feeling that you get from there. You can really see that. Yeah, and uh, we have a lot to learn from them. Actually, 
I have a book uh, to recommend about that, uh, written by a rabbi. Uh, it's Rabbi oh, Shalom yes. Harris. Shalom Arash, yeah, the Garden of Peace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, guys, very good book. Yeah, it's actually summarized in a very simple language, Jewish marital law and different tips uh, that are in the Talmud. And, and that book is and that book is has has some issues, but it also has a lot of good points. Uh, mm -hmm. He wrote another book called The Garden of Amuna, which is a nice book as well that he wrote. Yeah, I know. Uh, I haven't read it. I would love to read it. Yeah, I have. Yes. Read it. So, but Shalom Rush is a good author, you know, so I, I, I know many positives to that book, but I also, you know, people should know this. You know, it's like when, when, when Jesus came, he said to take the, the new covenant was to not to do away with the Torah. It was to take it off paper and put it on our hearts. You know, so not to do away with the instructions and the roles and, and everything God wanted us to do. It's just to take it off paper, out of religion, and put it on our hearts and make it a personal encounter. Right, right. Okay, guys, do you have any more questions? So uh, so the same guy who asked about the foods uh, in the Garden of Eden and after the fall He's also asking about the uh, the original language of the New Testament. What well, was that? that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, it's commonly thought that it was uh, Greek. But we do know some of the books were written in Hebrew. And I have some sources to say that it was most likely Aramaic. Okay. And then he's, he's also asking why the many Christian denominations contradicting each other. Well, uh, because you, you answered the question, uh, different denominations. <laughs> they all have their different uh, opinions or viewpoints on what they're reading. So different, the different is the answer. You know, so, and, and they don't necessarily, um, I wouldn't use the word contradiction. They just have a different viewpoint. And sometimes it, it, it might be... Uh, opposite but that's an everywhere in, in in earth not just in christianity it's just a different viewpoint a different way of looking at it so uh but then all christians for the most part have the same belief in in the resurrection and the savior of, of salvation of jesus but all the nuances of of what to do in a daily life that might be a little bit different and that's not just within christianity that, that's that's everywhere Mm -hmm. Okay. He's also asking about uh, um, a theological point of uh, Trinitarianism, Trinitarianism uh, like Trinity. Then he uses the word modalism. I'm not familiar with this term in terms of theology. Or And the biblical Unitarianism. Like, I guess it's just uh, believe in one God and not the Trinity. Yeah. Like, well, like, like I'm not really familiar with those terms, some of them. Yeah. Maybe. The predicism part is a little different than the other terms, but, you know, I don't believe everything's already been done and fulfilled as of yet. Uh, but as for the, the the Bible, I believe in the word of scripture and it says God is one. It says God is one. And I, but it also says in the Bible that we do not have the knowledge of everything and knowing everything that God wants us to know or that we should know. So uh, without directly answering, I will say I will never limit God and who he could be. And I will never limit the, the process of what could happen. It doesn't make sense to my mind as a human that dogs can talk and donkeys can talk and animals can snakes can talk. But I the Bible said it happened and I do believe it happened. But my own human mind can't comprehend that. So when the Bible says that there's one God, I trust that is one God. Now, can God be in a human form at the same time? Can it be a, a son or is it actually God in a human form? My human mind can't wrap around certain concepts, and but I will never limit what God can do just because I don't understand it. And uh, so there is one God and the way he expresses that uh, I, I, I'm not going to limit because uh, I understand the boundaries of my understanding according to scripture. And I also acknowledge there are some people that uh, do not take certain things in the scriptures literally, that certain things happened, like a, a talking snake and 
and resurrection of people and all this stuff. But it says it happened. I believe it happened. And I'm not going to limit the view to man's ideas of who, who God is or what he can do in terms of that. I know who he is, but in terms of how he expresses himself, whether it's through his son or or his son's separate and, and always different, I'm not going to let my lack of knowledge limit me from who he is. And I will accept him as one, but I do know that the scriptures say, and I believe truly, the one who was resurrected, Yeshua, uh, has, I believe every single word Yeshua said in the scriptures of who he is. Okay. Okay, guys, do you have any more questions? Because we are approaching the end of the interview for today. If you have anything else to say, just unmute yourself and do that. Don't be shy. Okay, folks, so now towards the end, I would like just for people who didn't see the pre our previous meeting now towards the end, I would like to tell us a little bit about your the services you provide, your shop, in relation to raw foods, sure. uh, your ministry, sure. and uh, if people are interested in going in this direction and learning more about that, whatever feels right sure. to you about your activities. Well, uh, my main health channel is rawlifehealthshow.com. Rawlifehealthshow.com. It's currently going under construction, uh, but we're going to be uh, revitalizing it soon as a member site to give my top videos of all time. I still have a YouTube channel where I have thousands of videos, Raw Life Health Show. Uh, my ministry website is Torah Life Ministries with an S at the end, org. I have a channel where I do uh, videos about the Bible all the time. And we do live prayer every morning. And we also have a, a, a meeting, a gathering on Friday nights. And that is Torah Life Ministries on YouTube. And I also have a channel where I teach people how to grow food and grow trees and grow fruit trees and sprout and do all these things. And that's Fruitful Trees. Fruitful Trees on YouTube. So those are places you can find me. I'm on social media, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, just look up my name and you can contact me through there if you want to get in touch with me. Excellent. Excellent. And I just have a question. For example, if a person wants to join your gathering of your ministries, right? Uh, but uh, do, do they need to be a believer or do are there any requirements for people to join um, and to participate? Uh, yes. Well, uh, the website, I mean, if you just go to YouTube on Friday nights, uh, anyone could join our prayer meeting on YouTube as well every morning, at, uh, uh, well, Monday to Friday, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time. But on Friday nights, we meet at 9 p.m. on Torah Life Ministries. Uh, and anyone that's looking to learn uh, is welcome. But if you want to be on camera, you need to dress modestly. That's that's a requirement. <laughs> Uh, and if you want your picture to show on camera, if not, you can come join us with a heart to learn. We, you know, I'm not into debates. I don't debate. Uh, we're here to just learn and teach and enjoy. And, and I would hope if somebody's coming there, it would be with a learning heart, you know, and not a heart of rebellion to come and come against it. But everyone's welcome to, uh, to join us and, and check it out and see what we're doing there. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll post all the links below the video so people can come and join. So, Paul, thank you so much. Thank I will I will connect between you and Frederick if you want to interview him. Absolutely. Try fasting and whatever. Yes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and hopefully maybe we can be in touch and meet again a few months from now. Just talk, talk about other things. So thank you so, Absolutely. so much. And have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was wonderful.